thank you very much for tuning in today's guys to today's live streaming. Today is the 15th of April. This conversation with Dr. Marandi is recorded during the noontime and I'm broadcasting it now live on Syriana Analysis, YouTube and Rumble channels. Dr. Marandi, you're a professor at Tehran University and you previously advised Iran's nuclear negotiation team. Thank you so much for being with me today in order to shed light and bring insight from Iran of what happened in the past two days. In my opinion, this was a breaking point in the region, something that was unprecedented. However, there are different views, so I would like to hear the view from Iran. As we may know, on uh, the 1st of April, uh, there was a strike from uh, uh, from Israel on the consulate of Iran in Damascus and a few uh, Iranian or six Iranian uh, military personnel, 12 of them were senior uh, commanders and generals were killed by Israel. Iran vote to retaliate and we've seen now the retaliation, uh, different types of uh, military equipment were used against Israel. I would like to know from Iran, how do you see the nature of the attack first and what military and political goals were achieved by these attacks on Israel? Well, thank you again for having me. Uh, I think it's pretty clear for your viewers that Iran has shown a lot of strategic patience over the years uh, with regards to the Israeli regime. Uh, in the past, the Israelis would bomb Iranian officers who were helping in the fight against ISIS and Al-Qaeda and their affiliates in Syria. And back then, the Iranians would not strike back because there were enough there was enough trouble as it was in Syria with these Western-backed, Israeli-backed, and regionally-backed terror groups. And uh, then in the past few months, again, the Israeli regime started to kill a number of Iranians in Syria, Iranians who were involved in supporting the resistance, supporting Hamas, Islamic Jihad, Hezbollah, and, and others. And the Iranians, again, showed strategic patience. So Iran has been making huge sacrifices over the decades by through the sanctions, because all the sanctions against Iran are because of Israel. It hasn't it really has nothing to do with the nuclear program or human rights or uh, terrorism or whatever else the, the West would like to throw at Iran. Tomorrow will probably be global warming or something. <laughs> but uh, but um, here again, the Iranians show strategic patience in the past few months because they wanted the focus to be on Gaza. Then the Israeli regime, when they attacked the embassy and violated international law and murdered Iranian uh, civilians, and of course violated Syrian airspace for the, I don't know how many times, many hundreds of times they've done it before. But here the Iranians saw that they had to respond because if they didn't, then the Israeli regime would start bombing other embassies in Beirut and other uh, diplomatic uh, buildings of Iran. And the West, of course, as we saw in the UN Security Council, will support this. The US, France, and Britain and the UN Security Council refused to condemn it uh, and uh, let alone punish the Israeli regime. So the Iranians did have to respond, but also it gave Iran an opportunity because the whole of the international community, and minus the West, which really doesn't matter, they condemned the Israelis. So it gave Iran the opportunity to strike back uh, with the full support of the global south, as as we saw in the UN Security Council and el elsewhere. Actually, this but, was very important case, uh, Dr. Marandi, the legal ground for the Iranian attack on uh, Israel. Uh, on one hand, I, ha I have heard legal ar arguments which uh, says this is legal to strike the Iranian consulate in Damascus because it was used as an Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps headquarter and they were planning attacks on Israel. So this is the justification that we are allowed to bomb the consulate. And on the other hand, now we have the legal arguments coming from the Iranian side in this uh, context. So how do you see the legal argument from the Israeli side and on what legal ground uh, has uh, this attack stands uh, in, be, before before attacking Israel? Because this was a major attack on a, on, on a country like uh, Israel, right? Well, the Israeli argument is, is nonsense. If, uh, first of all, anything that the Israelis say is suspect. Remember the tunnels uh, and the command centers under the 
Al Shifa Hospital, which were non-existent. We all remember all the lies that the Israelis have been spouting over the past six months. So nothing that the Israelis or their Western backers say make any sense or have any meaning or any uh, carry any weight. But uh, it doesn't matter what Iran does in its uh, in its diplomat in its embassy. It's a it's an Iranian embassy, and the host state has no problem with it. The U.S. has military staff and spies and CIA officers in all of its embassies. Its embassy in Baghdad is larger than the Vatican. <laughs> it's building an embassy in Lebanon, uh, which is, I think, like 50 hectares or uh, it's, it's, it's massive. So the United States is building fortresses. They're not uh, building fortresses so that people can go in and watch movies. Uh, but uh, the Iranian embassy is a known building in Damascus, and uh, the Israelis uh, violated Iranian sovereignty. So Iran had to respond. But what Iran did was actually very smart. And the Western media is trying to create this narrative that this was a great success by the West. First of all, the collective West protect, tried to protect the Israelis. It was the Americans, the British, the French, the Jordanian regime. All of them worked together, 10 countries in total, to block the Iranian strike. But what was the Iranian objective? Mm -hmm. The Iranians wanted to deplete Israeli defenses and Western defenses, and they wanted to figure out what sort of capabilities they have. Yes. So what did the Iranians do? They sent a couple of hundred drones uh, or more than 100 drones, each costing, I don't know, $10,000 for Iran to make. They're made locally, very cheap. And in general, it's 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 a very important thing to note. High-tech goods in general are very cheap. They're difficult to, uh, the, the research is very expensive, but the actual product is very cheap. So mm -hmm. iPhones are very cheap or Huawei's or or whatever, they're all very cheap. It's that technology, it's that research that goes behind mm -hmm. it to develop them that's expensive. So each of the and, the, and these are all old, these were all old Iranian drones, old technology. Why did they do this? Because the Iranians didn't want to reveal any of their new technological capabilities. Mm -hmm. So they sent these old drones that have been in stock for many years, and what did the Israelis and the West do? They took the bait because these were decoys. So they went all out and fired all these expensive missiles and all used all their uh, missile defense capabilities, uh, costing at least $1.3 billion, according yes. to their own estimates. And indirect estimates would put it much higher. But the Iranians probably spent couple of million dollars on the drones. Mm. So they gained nothing from Iran. And remember, the Iranians literally announced what they're going to do. Yes. And when they set off the drones, it took two, three hours to get there. The Iranians yes. knew exactly what they're well, <laughs> what they were doing. In fact, all the, if the Iranians wanted a swift attack, they could have just launched missiles uh, unexpectedly. And uh, and it would have been a different situation. So the Iranians wanted to engage all the air defense capabilities, deplete them, but also to understand those capabilities, to gain insight mm -hmm. into what the Americans and the Israelis and the others have. Then Iran sent uh, a, a series of older missiles uh, after the drones reached uh, Palestine. And those older missiles were also, they had no technology that was of any use to the West. And again, um, the collective West engaged in uh, anti-aircraft uh, missile defense uh, launches and um, and again, it revealed their capabilities and uh, their expensive, uh, they used their expensive missiles and revealed their capabilities against uh, old missiles. So again, the Iranians spent a couple of million dollars there, and uh, then the Iranians use, and I don't know the exact number here, but 
between 10 and 20 missiles on mm -hmm. two targets, military targets, unlike yes. the Israeli regime that targets civilians. They targeted an air base in the south and an yes. intelligence gathering base in the north, which is affiliated to the Air Force, if I'm not mistaken, the Israeli Air Force, with more modern drones, not their top notch drones. Mm not their, uh, the uh, not, oh, sorry, missiles, with more modern missiles, but not their best missiles, not any of their new technology. And these are still old missiles. These missiles got through, and we can debate how much damage they caused, but the point was that all these air defense capabilities, all these missile defense capabilities were engaged, uh, and uh, two of the most uh, heavily defended parts of Israel, the air base in the south with F-35s, were hit with a number of missiles, at least seven, uh, according to the photos and the um, uh, the, the footage, and a, a, a number in in the north. So at least, so this from the Iranian perspective was completely successful yes. because they learned everything about Western defense capabilities and they sent a message because they got through and hit the most sensitive sites in Israel. And one final point that is also of uh, great significance and, and that is that these weapons are not only expensive, they're very few in number nowadays mm -hmm. because in Ukraine, the West has been pursuing the same foolish policy. And that is that the Russians would send drones in, and they're very similar to the Iranian drones for some reason. But in any case, they send drones in and missiles in, and the West constantly engages uh, foolishly uh, and strikes these uh, drones and missiles with their expensive air defense missiles and deplete them. And uh, so it's more, much more costly for the West. Very good for the Russians, inexpensive, and they don't give out, they don't give too much information. And then, the, and then like the Israelis, the Ukrainians would always say, well, we shot down 99% <laughs> of uh, all the drones. And, but now we see that Ukraine has no electricity in many parts of the country, the infrastructure is destroyed. So we know the truth. So what Iran has done basically is they, they've depleted their defenses, gained the intelligence that they need. And next time round, if there's going to be a strike, the Iranians are not going to send 300 drones. They're going to send, or 200 drones, they're going to send thousands of drones. Mm -hmm. And they're going to mix them with modern drones. And they're going to send large numbers of missiles. And they're going to include advanced missiles because they're all going to get through. Mm -hmm. And so the Americans and the Israelis can, can pretend that they scored a victory in public and sort of talk to themselves in this echo chamber, but those who know what's going on in the West, they know that this is not good news yes. and nor good policy. The 99% uh, report that the senior Israeli official uh, mentioned, uh, it reminded me of Mohammed Saeed al-Sahaf during the <laughs> 2003 invasion of Iraq. And despite my complete sympathy with the Iraq, I, I, Iraqi nation back then, but it was stupid propaganda uh, by him when he was standing in the street and, and telling the people that the Americans are committing suicide on the uh, periphery or on the borders of Iraq or on the borders of Baghdad. That and this was similar, I would say, not so wise uh, statement from the Israeli uh, senior official to the Israeli press. And since you mentioned that next time there could be a next round, you were on uh, Channel 4 actually, and you said if the Israeli regime wants to continue, Iran will have the excuse to hit it harder and harder. And the question here is isn't this what Netanyahu wants, like to drag? Iran into more escalation or more confrontation with the Israeli side so that the Americans and the Brits intervene this time for a larger regional war since the Netanyahu government is stuck in the Gaza Strip and they're unable to achieve their military goals there. Well, I think another thing that has been exposed by this attack is the sheer reluctance of the Americans to step mm -hmm. forward. And this, I think, greatly diminishes Israeli influence and power and American influence and power. We know 
that the United States is afraid of any conflict with Iran. Remember, back in the day when Iran was much weaker and the United States was at the height of its power in the 1990s after the collapse of the Soviet Union and the stupidity of Saddam Hussein when he went into Kuwait and gave the Americans a, a big win. So uh, after Kuwait and after the collapse of the Soviet Union, the Americans were at the top of the world. They, you know, they spoke of Fukuyama wrote you know, about the end of history, yes. which is still something that they believe in, even though Fukuyama took, you know, withdrew the, the claim, but still that's basically what they, they're saying in the West uh, among elites. They still believe that. And that's why they're pursuing such foolish policies that are that undermines the West itself. But that's for another day. So uh, he, when uh, the the West um in well let me put it this way the iranians they have back then they were very vulnerable yes and uh after the invasion of iraq and kuwait and sorry the invasion of iraq and afghanistan the americans were still extremely powerful and they had surrounded iran so in the 1990s and in the first decade of uh the, 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 the yes the iranians were very vulnerable but still the united states never attacked iranian territory because they knew that iran was ideologically very different very uh highly motivated to to defend against aggression it's it's very much a part of the religious culture mm -hmm. in iran you know uh karbala imam hussein uh, it's you know in Iran is Ashura Tasua Ashura mm -hmm. is like the the most important days in in the calendar. You'll see people across the country, religious and secular, uh, Christians and Muslims all join and uh, Shias and Sunnis all participating in these uh, uh, ceremonies. So uh, the Americans knew that Iran was too powerful for it to attack it. Now. The United States is a, a really it's a diminished power compared to what it was three decades ago. It's it's amazing how fast it's declined in in all respects. It's still a, a superpower. I mean, that's I'm not saying that you know the United States is a is like the UK today in comparison to what the UK was a couple of hundred years ago, but the United States is a diminished power, relatively speaking. And Iran is much more powerful today. The United States has been forced to leave Iraq. It's been forced to leave Afghanistan. It has huge problems with Russia, China. Its the economy is declining. Uh, its people are exhausted because of the endless wars. Its neoliberalism is devastating, has devastated the middle class, and we can go on. Yes. And, and, and Europe as well. Look at Germany today and compare uh, Germany today with what it was just a few years ago. So this is a, a general problem in the West. So on the other hand, Iran has been empowered. Its uh, military capabilities are much greater today. Its technology is very advanced. And Iran has uh, uh, created or has built major alliances across the region in Yemen, in Syria, in Iraq, in uh, Lebanon and in Palestine. And on the other hand, the Iranians have to a large degree been able to break the isolation that the West imposed on Iran through sanctions. It joined the BRICS, the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. So Iran's uh, position today is much stronger than it was two, three decades ago. And uh, the American and the Western position is much weaker. So we always knew that the Americans were not foolish enough or stupid enough to engage in a war with Iran, because immediately American bases in, in Iraq would be overrun. They would lose Syria because their, their illegal occupation in Syria is dependent on their illegal occupation in Iraq. Yes. And all of their bases in the Persian Gulf would be destroyed. And of course, those countries that host American bases would be seen as guilty by association and their infrastructure would be destroyed as well. They would be seen as hostile. That's why before the strike, Iran also warned these countries not to let the Americans use their bases, otherwise they will be punished. And uh, so the Iranians warned everyone beforehand, 
And these countries, these family dictatorships, these regimes, they all recognized during the last few days yes. that the American presence in their country is not really creating security. It's creating a threat yes. because the Americans, if they do something that these regimes don't want, these regimes can pay the price. Yes. And then ultimately we saw that these different countries told the Americas that they can't use their bases, which also limits them, uh, diminishes the American prestige and role in, in the region. And ultimately, after the Iranians carried out their uh, well-planned and well-devised uh, retaliation against Israeli, the Israeli regime for their rogue behavior, the Americans did not strike Iran. They, they did not touch Iran. And I think that for many ordinary Iranians who are less politically aware of what we what I've just explained, they understood that Iran is much more powerful than mm -hmm. they thought, and that the United States is much more vulnerable than it claims to be. So this ev event has also diminished the United States because people in th these family dictatorships in the region, which rely on the West until now, they've been saying, well, the United States will protect my family and my, my hold over this country. But now when they look and they say, well, the Iranians attacked Israel and the Americans did nothing. We are nothing for the Americans, for the American elites compared to Israel. So obviously they're not going to do anything for us either. So I think there's, uh, you know, this is just a condition, uh, a continuation uh, of the decline of American power in the region and the decline of those entities that depend on the Americans. And one thing that I should add here, which is a bit, um, uh, let's say, it's a, it's not directly impacted by this. The West constantly says that you know our arabs want to reconcile with israel or arabs want to build a new relationship with israel and the israelis have been saying we have to work together with a with the moderate arabs to create a coalition against the iranian threat the, again this is um this is something that the west is um is delusional about arabs hate israel just because a few corrupt dictators that they've imposed, you know, the sort that always get 99% of the vote, mm -hmm. like the 99% of the drones that were down. <laughs> uh, these people do not reflect our public opinion. When Jordan allows the Americans and the Israelis to, to use their airspace to strike the Iranian drones, which was expected by Iran, the Iranians allowed that to happen yes. because it undermines the Jordanian regime because it's seen as complicit. This is something that the West refuses to understand because they, they live in an echo chamber. They talk to themselves and convince themselves about all their great victories, their great victory against uh, Russia, their great victory against Iran, their great victory against uh, China, they're great. They're always having these great victories in Iraq and Afghanistan and Libya. Everywhere we see Western victories, but for some reason, when we add all these up, the West is falling down a cliff yes. and the global South is on the rise. You know, um, if you if we go back a little bit in history and we see all empires have expanded and they have committed the same mistakes over and over again. And the problem with the Americans is that since the fall of the Soviet Union, um, they couldn't preserve their peak of dominance for quite a long time. There were some empires who were able, when they reached to the peak of power, they, they were able to stay there for a hundred years or more. But the, American, yeah, but the Americans, what they did basically, the elites in the United States, um, they overstretched around the world. They have 800 military bases. The expenditure is very high. But 
uh, when you are an empire and you expand, you want to harvest the fruits of this, right? While you're expanding at the end of the day, whether directly or indirectly, to harvest the benefits. But when you harvest the benefits for the interests of your own people, so your people are living in welfare and your people are getting the benefits of living in an in in an empire then of course the people would support the government but in the case of the united states it's very divided society nowadays and the people can see through that all this expenditure on the military is coming back recycled to the pockets of these few people who are in power in the united states and also in the united states there was this attempt to uh, spread wokeism, right? Social justice. We have to bring justice, uh, historical justice, uh, black and white lines, dividing the people on different lines. But this was a more a divide and conquer strategy from the United States elites against its own people. But this has backfired now during the Palestine conflict that the most of the woke people that they wanted to control them, now they see that this is also about social justice. This is also about the historical justice for the Palestinians. Palestinian people, and it just exploded to their faces. Now they have a younger generation which hasn't lived the Iraq war or the Afghanistan war. They don't have the memory like we do, but they still can see through what's happening in the world. And that's why they want to ban TikTok. They want to now suppress these social media platforms. So I would argue that politically speaking, the United States, yes, the, the power is shrinking. But also the support of the people for the activities of the government is also shrinking. And this is very dangerous for them. Now that Tucker Carlson, for example, he hosted this Christian uh, priest, pastor from Bethlehem. This is like you are breaking the bone in the United States because uh, one of the main pillars of the American people's support to Israel, it stands on this evangelical, uh, uh, Christian evangelical Zionist support to Israel. And when you have increasing number of people, call them whatever you want, call uh, Tucker Carlson or other uh, per big personalities in, 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 in the United States, they're actually uh, fastening in my opinion, uh, this process of the United States becoming, uh, staying as a superpower, but not uh, uh, b b not stay as a dominant power around the world. Now, uh, the Russians and the Chinese, in my opinion, because uh, the Iranians, they have discussed this extensively before the strikes with the Chinese and with the, uh, with the Russians. And the Russians came in defense of the um, the Iranians in the UN Security Council and the special envoy said what happened on the night of April 14 didn't happen in a vacuum. Iran's steps were a response to the shameful inaction of the UN Security Council and a response to Israel's blatant attack on Damascus. By no means the first, Syria is constantly being bombed by Israel. China comes and says that the current tensions in the Middle East are consequence of the Gaza war. So. All these mistakes, accumulated mistakes by the United States in the past, uh, and this is what Brzezinski warned, uh, don't bring China, Iran, and Russia together. This is a nightmare for the United States. And all these miscalculations actually have led that all these three countries are coming closer and closer and closer together now. And, and if, if these countries strike strategic partnership and alliances, those are the three pillars of Eurasia. This will be the end of the American uh, supremacy uh, over the world, don't you think? I, I agree. I, I would add a couple of things. One is that uh, those people who were uh, promoting woke culture, uh, whatever the results among young Americans, uh, they've also been exposed as completely hypocritical to their audiences because they have been supporting the genocide. The Democratic Party in the United States has, is just as genocidal as the Republican Party. And that has also diminished the United States because young people and people from all walks of life, Jews, Christians, Muslims, Hindus, everyone, you, you see people outraged uh, by this genocide and heroically creating a resistance to the genocide in the United States. So these people have also been exposed as being racist and hypocritical, despite the fact that they speak of wokeness and all that. And then on the other hand, uh, you, you, you're you absolutely correct. On the right, you see people like Tucker Carlson, but also the 
uh, guy from Infowars. Yes, uh, I uh, forgot his name, but I know. <laughs> yeah, and then Joe Rogan and yeah. Candace Owens, yeah. all of them breaking away from this narrative. So on the left and on the right of U.S. politics, these two political parties, or the Uniparty, which are two factions of the same party, the Republicans and the Democrats, they are being hammered. And Israel is being exposed in the United States for what it is. So the United States has not only diminished itself, its soft power across the world and the West, because of its supporting the genocide, the ongoing genocide in Gaza, they've, they've destroyed their military capacity through their foolish war in Ukraine and their endless wars across the region. And they've diminished their economic power because of their neo uh, liberal policies, because of, again, their endless wars, because of the fact that they sanctioned so many different countries. They've isolated themselves. And again, Germany, where, where you live, is a very good example of, of rapid decline and, 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 and winter, uh, the approaching winter for Europe. And then uh, 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 alongside all of this, you have the weakening foundations of the political order in the collective West, because people, young people, people from all walks of life, people from all ethnic backgrounds and all religious backgrounds are seeing the reality and are becoming increasingly intolerant of the genocidal policies of the West. So now you see in the United States, some of the key opponents of Zionism are Jews, and they are heroically fighting against the machine, yes. and Christians, and Muslims, and Hindus, and all sorts of people. And it's not yes. just young people, but this is an extraordinary shift. And we see the huge demonstrations in uh, London and other capitals, and we see both with people within the West, but also outside of the West, the more, I don't want to go too close to where you live, I don't want to cause you difficulty, <laughs> but the more, the increasing intolerance That's that is true. being showed to, uh, uh, with regards to free speech, criticism of genocide, and uh, again, I don't want to expand. <laughs> <laughs> it shows it shows that the system is nervous, and uh, there are many demonstrations here in Berlin. Uh, of course, you you will not see the footage of these demonstrations because they don't cover it in the mainstream media. But the rest assured, there are thousands and thousands of people every weekend. They go to demonstrate uh, against uh, the Israeli onslaught. And uh, the government is increasingly getting nervous after the Nicaraguan case against uh, against Germany. And the police uh, brutality is also increasing. Uh, there are certain measures that they are now uh, adopting, which I, I know those are like ABC, uh, like they provoke the people, they touch women, uh, for example, in a way that um, uh, it, it it looks like it's a physical assault so that men would intervene. And then when the men intervene, it's a clear cut case for the police to use more uh, brutality because now you touch the police and you're not allowed to touch the police or they choose the uh, the oldest person in the group or the younger person in the group. They know how to provoke the people. And beside that, now we have journalists. I don't know if we have to call them journalists. I call them prostitutes. They're coming with their big cameras there is no logo on the camera, and they're protected by uh, security. Uh, we don't know if they're secret service or not because they're uh, uh, dressing civil. But why would a journalist come with the security? To because they they are aiming at something, and what they do basically, they bring the camera, they put it to your face, they're provoking you so that they say. Tonight you're going to be on TV and we're going to call you an anti-Semite. So the people will start to act against the journalists and then the security intervenes again. The bus stations, the train stations are, are closed where the demonstrations are happening. So uh, few people arrive uh, to these places. So many other measures are taking place here, right? Now, this is the last part I want to discuss with you, Dr. And also one, one thing that yeah. I found also interesting, and that is a lot of people are now revisiting even previous policies of the West. So, for example, yes. in the case of Syria, yes, yes, which is uh, uh, <laughs> close to your heart, now many people 
understand what really happened in Syria. Yes, so true. <laughs> Everyone, those people who were trying to undermine the country and were cooperating with the West, and uh, we know, for example, you know, and I'm sure you've discussed this many times, mm -hmm. James Jack Sullivan's email to Hillary Clinton on February the 12th, 2012, mm -hmm. that Al-Qaeda is on our side. The leaked audio of Kerry saying we allowed ISIS to advance on Damascus. The Defense Intelligence Agency document of 2012 saying that they wanted to establish a Salafist entity that regional countries between Syria and Iraq and the admission by General Flynn that Obama and the administration uh, supported that. And that was, of course, ISIS. All these back then we kept repeating to people and there was very little traction. But now people are recognizing that the United States and the West, which carried out this dirty war in Syria with their regional allies, they were doing it in the interest of the Israeli regime. Yeah. And those people who were siding with the West, they were I, I don't want to use, uh, they were the useful is it, idiots. Yes, they are. They were. They were the useful idiots. And they held, and, and, and what the objective was, was to destroy the resistance, to break the link between Gaza, Lebanon, and uh, its allies in Iran. That was the objective. It was yeah. the objective was to destroy the country, to fragment the country. Uh, Erdogan could have his part of the country to become the, this Ottoman emperor of sorts. Uh, regional despots could uh, distract attention away from the lack of freedom in their countries by uh, using uh, sectarianism and hatred to destroy Syria, to sort of revive their fortunes because they felt under threat after what had happened in uh, Tunisia and Egypt. It was a counter-revolution what they were doing <laughs> in Syria. So all those actors that today are doing nothing to help the people of Gaza were in on this uh, conspiracy against the Syrian people. All of it was done for the sake of the Israeli regime, fundamentally. And now people are seeing the reality. Yeah. Where is it, Where was the embassy, Iranian embassy bombed? It was the Damascus. It was in Damascus. Why is it is Damascus constantly being bombed by the Israeli regime? Mm. Why doesn't the Israeli regime bomb Idlib? Yeah. Why doesn't it bomb ISIS uh, near Al Tanaf? Mm. Why don't the Ameri <laughs> Because it's in because the Assyrians are playing a role to support the resistance, and those proxies in Idlib and elsewhere are actually being used to weaken the resistance against the Israeli regime. Many people are waking up to this fact, except for those people who will ultimately, there, there's a group of people uh, <laughs> in our region and in the West who supposedly <laughs> support Palestine, uh, may, may I tell you some examples? And we discussed this before the show. Yeah, but yeah. I will I will tell you some examples so that you comment on this because this was the last part that I wanted. I, I cannot. Yeah, I just want like, to say that if yeah. Palestine is liberated, yeah. these people will be extremely unhappy, even though they <laughs> pretend to be pro-Palestinian, and they will call this a an evil conspiracy between mm -hmm. you know the Persians and what you know because they're actually the anti-Semites because they're the yes. only people who use like they say Jews and that sort yes. of thing. Uh, our, our, the resistance marks a, sh a, a clear distinction between uh, Jews and Zionism. In fact, most Zionists are, are not Jews, they're Christians, and many of them mm. are not even religious. But mm. these people who uh, are have never been of any use to the cause of liberation of Palestine and have always used uh, extremist language nice. and who um, and who are allowed to and who are well funded uh, by different countries and bodies, mm. uh, these people, uh, they, they they will not change. They will continue to do the, to the same thing, but I think they've exposed themselves for what they really are. 
Yes, uh, just quickly your comment really um, on this because I, I read this tweet by Mohammed Hijab. He says, Iran is one of the most careful players in the region. And if I had to guess, I would think they have regular communication with the United States. The mission fiasco wasn't a UFC match. It was a WWE match. And I uh, commented to him and said, Mashallah, brother, can I touch your head to get some of your political intellect? And then we have another um, activist, uh, Ahmad, says Iran it advertently gave Netanyahu his get out of jail card. The world tide was rightfully and long overdue turning against Israel's rogue racist apartheid regime led by Netanyahu. Now in a billionaire's bunker equipped palace, Netanyahu is framing himself and Israel as the victim, even though they are the occupier, the aggressor and the ones who attacked Iranian soil in Syria. And in doing so, violating the Vienna Convention, the U.S. will benefit by selling even more weapons to Netanyahu to try to complete his genocide and ethnic cleansing of Gaza. So apparently, um, the Iranian attack, according to these personalities, was a, a conspiracy. It was a theater, and um, it has given a carte blanche or help for Netanyahu to continue its genocide against the Palestinians there. I mean, I truly, I sometimes try to keep my posture and uh, not to use the bad words <laughs> but I how can i you. how can i discuss with them you know what's the ground There's that no i can <laughs> you see i mean i don't know these people so i don't want to comment on them mm. I, I have no idea who they mm. are and i i don't follow them but I, those are arguments them. right those are yeah, arguments uh, so so what my what i'm going to say it doesn't reflect on any individual in, mm. in particular if it wasn't for iran would Gaza, the resistance in Gaza have survived six months. All those tunnels, all these capabilities, did they come out of the blue? All of, uh, and even as we speak, new tunnels are being made. New recruits are coming in for Hamas and Islamic Jihad and the others. And new capabilities are being brought into uh, play for the resistance in Gaza. Without the support of Iran, would they exist? Without the support of Iran, would the siege on Israeli ports in the Red Sea have succeeded? And also, this is actually another good example. The Americans failed to, to stop the missile striking the ships. They failed completely. Does anyone really believe that after failing in the Red Sea, they've succeeded against the Iranian missiles, which are far more developed than the missiles used in Yemen, the Iranians knew exactly what they were doing. They were diminishing the Israeli regime. They were showing the world, and especially the Israelis, uh, that they are vulnerable. And that for now, and Iran has changed the equation here. Iran has said after its strike that for now on, when the Israeli regime hits Iranians, wherever they may be, Iran will strike back. So for now on, there's a new deterrence. For now on, the Israelis can no longer just go bomb Iranians wherever they want. That 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 um, the era of strategic patience is over. So those people who you know who see themselves as Twitter warriors, what have they actually done for Gaza? Uh, you know practically compared to what the Iranians have done. The Iranians have been sanctioned for 40 years. Are we, you know, for 40 years, we've been in bed with the Americans and they've been imposing maximum sanctions on us. And we've been in bed with the Americans, but, you know, the Iranians helped create the defense capabilities and gods. The heroic resistance, you know, needed the capabilities for them to be able to stand up. Otherwise, if they are disarmed, what what can they do? In Yemen, in Lebanon, uh, and elsewhere, this this came at a big, great cost to Iran financially, uh, and and Iran has given lives for this. So uh, I think that the and and also one final point is that these people uh, have fallen into the narrative, uh, the trap of the Western narrative. Netanyahu is no exception. Uh, in Israeli politics. Yes. This is a genocidal regime. So if Netanyahu goes, everything is okay now? <laughs> that is exactly what the West wants us to believe because they are ultimately, I think, going to carry out a political coup against Netanyahu 
or cut a deal with Netanyahu where he steps aside and doesn't go to jail. And then they'll bring someone else into power, one of these people who's been just as much a part of the genocide. And they say, well, yes, the problem was Netanyahu. And now we have a moderate Israeli uh, prime minister and history is forgotten. And, the, and you know, it's like, it's like saying, you know, the Nazis after uh, all their atrocities, Hitler has been replaced by one of his henchmen. This henchman is a good guy and he's different. And that's not how, you know, that's not, that's not uh, a sane worldview. It's not a, an acceptable worldview and no one should fall into that trap. The Israeli regime is a genocidal regime. The Israeli uh, the Zionist population is in Israel overwhelmingly supports the genocide over and the majority of them are complain that it, the genocide is, has not gone far enough. So let's not fool ourselves about Netanyahu and the fate of Netanyahu. What needs to happen is for the Israeli regime as an apartheid regime to collapse altogether and for Jews, Muslims, Christians, and, and anyone else who belongs to that land to be able to live as equal human beings. Mm -hmm. Ethno supremacism must go. But this for these people and for the Western elites is outrageous. You know, you, you mean ethno supremacism must go? That's unacceptable. It, it, it's ironic that they don't see the hypocrisy of their views in the West. And these people don't see that they're mimicking and repeating uh, these uh, un, uh, un, you know, these Western narratives that are there uh, because there's an agenda. Yes. Just for the viewers to know, guys, there are increasing number of Israeli journalists nowadays are writing clearly, especially in the Haaretz, that we have lost this war and we have to speak the truth about what's happening in Israel because they say, those are Israeli journalists, that the Israeli government and the system there, they have imposed a, a complete blackout for the information in Israel and the people are living in a bubble, thinking that victory is just a few steps away and they're going to achieve it today, tomorrow in, the, uh, in, in northern Gaza. Gaza, in, in, in the central Gaza, and then to the southern Gaza, and then the recycling the same lies over and over again with the different objectives now. So I would argue that the Israeli population are also uh, the victim for this propaganda of their government. And uh, some of them, uh, of course, they uh, most of them actually, over 70%, they, they think that Israel is not using enough force in Gaza, or uh, it's it's a really uh, difficult, it's, a, it's, it's worth studying psychologically, I would say. This is the least to say but absolutely uh, absolutely yeah. dr Marandi, and and fine and and, and one final point is that um uh, i i think that uh some of these people who have been very uh who've been attacking iran for the last 24 hours uh they're very unhappy to see the celebrations that the palestinians and gaza and the west bank and even inside the 1967 borders have been uh carrying out uh, during the uh, uh, the Iranian uh, response to the Israeli uh, uh, attack on the embassy, yes. so that makes them unhappy. Yes. They they care more about uh, uh, the West defeating Iran uh, than any liberation in Palestine. I saw a tweet for a Palestinian uh, boy in, in Gaza who said uh, this is the only night since six months that we were able to sleep uh, without the Israeli uh, fighter jets flying over our heads. Dr. Morandi, it's uh, always amazing uh, to chat with you and listen to your insights. The audience uh, were te on Sunday and Saturday. I was reading the comments on Syrian analysis and your name was like Merendi, Merendi, Merendi. People were like, please invite Dr. Merendi so that we uh, listen to uh, a perspective coming from Tehran. So I really appreciate your time. You're very kind. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, guys, for watching this uh, live streaming. And we will see you tomorrow, Tuesday, 5 p.m. Central European time, 11 a.m. Eastern American time. Stay tuned and we will see you.